Hello and welcome to NPTEL MOOC on Applied Electromagnetics for Engineers. In this module, we will consider reflection of waves and transmission of waves, but this time we will assume that the angle of incidence is not equal to 0, right. So, the previous case that we considered is what is called as normal incidence. We have already talked about what normal incidence is. Suppose this is my interface and this is the way in which the incident uniform uh, plane wave is approaching the medium. So, when it approaches straight in this way, right, then there is a certain perpendicular, uh, you know, there is a perpendicular uh, uh, vector to this interface. So, this is called as the medium or the plane of interface which separates out the two regions. So, this is region 1 and this below is the region 2. And if I say what is the, so if I consider this as a z axis, then z equal to 0 can be considered as the interface plane and the normal to that interface plane will be along the z axis. So, this would be the normal to the interface plane and my electric, fee, sorry, my incident beta vector which is, you know, incident on this one is parallel to the normal to the interface. So, the angle between this electric, sorry, the propagation vector, incident propagation vector and the normal to the interface is actually equal to 0. So, this is called as the normal incidence. Now, there is no reason and in fact, it is much more uh, common that uh, the incident propagation vector will not be in the same or will not be parallel to the plane of, uh, to the normal to the plane of interface. What I mean is that if this is the propagation constant, now the propagation constant can actually come at a certain angle over here. Okay. Remember, in the normal incidence case, you had the electric field to be perpendicular. So, it is little difficult for me to hold and show you both. So, I am assuming this way. So, this is how the propagation vector, you know, for the normal case was and the, mag in the electric field quantity was along the thumb direction that I have considered and this direction is what I considered as the x axis. Okay. So, the magnetic field was coming towards you. So, this was the magnetic field. My index finger is the magnetic field, okay, which was along the y axis. Now, clearly when the angle of incidence is not 0 or the normal incidence, things change a little bit. Now, this is your propagation vector. The electric field, you know, it cannot lie in the entirely along the x direction now because it has to be perpendicular to the k vector. So, essentially this vector when it rotated by an angle of theta i as measured with respect to the normal to the interface make, means that the electric field will now have both x as well as the z components. Similarly, the magnetic field can or cannot have the components. So, in one case, we consider the magnetic field to be along the y direction. Okay. So, electric field has two components x and z but the magnetic field has a single component along the y direction okay and the propagation vector is at an angle of 90 uh, sorry at an angle of certain angle theta i with respect to the normal so this index finger is now normal to the interface and these two are now at a certain angle okay so this case is what is called as the oblique incidence case and i have shown you only one example of this oblique incidence in which the electric field was in the same plane as the plane of interface as well as the you know, the normal thing that is in the x z plane which is called as the plane of incidence which contains the normal to the interface as well as the propagation vector okay in this case it was the x z plane that we considered then the electric field having both components x and z was in the plane of incidence. So, this particular uh, you know uh, component or this particular case is what is called as parallel polarization. Polarization, parallel polarization here indicating that electric field is in the plane of incidence and look at the magnetic field. It was actually transverse. It was along the y direction. It was transverse to the plane of incidence and it was lying in the plane of interface. So, this magnetic field h which is parallel to the electric field vector as well as the propagation vector beta okay, is therefore transverse to these two uh, you know, vectors and therefore this polarization, the parallel polarization is also called as transverse magnetic polarization. Okay. Now, what will happen once the wave hits you know, the interface at a certain angle? Well, there has to be a certain reflection because the medium impedances are not matched. So, there is an impedance, uh, sorry, there is a reflection out there. 
plus there will be some transmission. Okay. So, there is a reflection then there is a transmission as before in the same in the case of a normal incidence and our job is to determine how the reflected fields look and how the magnetic fields or the transmitted fields look and what is the ratio of the electric reflected to incident electric field and transmitted electric field to the incident electric field. Okay. And in this case we will see that this ratio has to be taken with a specific electric field components only. Okay. This has to be taken only with the tangential components. You should not take the ratios of E z reflected to E z incident or E z transmitted to E z incident. Okay. Those are not allowed. So, all these things can be made more clearer if you examine this picture that I have drawn here. So, you carefully look at the picture. There is a x and a z plane, the y plane of course is coming out of this page let us say or it is going into the page does not matter which way it is, but it is certainly perpendicular to the screen. Okay. In region 1 which has a certain impedance of let us say eta 1 and a medium of 2, medium 2 which has an impedance of eta 2, you have an incident wave vector. I have departed from the convention of taking beta as the propagation vector in favor of taking k as the propagation vector. This small change is because most of these concepts are applied at the optics community. It is common to consider k as the propagation vector rather than beta as the propagation vector. So, because of this small you know change in the notation, I hope that should not make the lecture itself be difficult to you. You just mentally substitute k with beta whenever you feel like. Okay. So, you have an incident wave vector. I denote the incident fields by a subscript i. Okay. So, you have k i, e i and h i. h i will be along the y direction okay. and e i is the incident electric field which is in the x z plane as is the k i incident wave vector. Because of the reflection there will be reflected fields and there will be transmitted fields. The reflected field or the you know, reflected wave will have an angle or will make an angle of theta r okay, as it propagates away from the plane of interface. The angle of incidence which is the angle between the incident wave vector k i and the normal to the surface or the plane of interface which is z axis is theta i. So, theta i, theta r and theta t respectively give you incident reflected and transmitted waves. Let me clear up one point over here. The frequencies of the incident wave will be the same as the frequency of the reflected wave and is the same as the frequency of the transmitted wave. Okay. The frequencies do not actually change. You can actually rigorously show that this is indeed true because the fields have to satisfy boundary condition. Okay. But there is a problem with the boundary condition as well that I will come to in a short while. But let me give you upfront that frequencies remain the same. So, we will not worry about the frequencies being different. Let me also give you a second note which is important in this context. Okay. Because the incident wave vector has a propagation incident fields or incident plane wave has a propagation vector k i, the magnitude of this k i if we denote this one by just k i without a bar on top of it must be related to the frequency of the incident wave and the constituent parameters of the medium. So, this must be omega times square root of mu 1 epsilon 1. Okay. Because the reflected wave is also in the same media, the magnitude of k r the reflected wave vector you know the reflected wave vector magnitude must also be equal to omega square root mu 1 epsilon 1. These two therefore, must be equal in magnitude. Of course, in direction they are different, but in magnitude they have to be equal. But these two are certainly not equal to the magnitude of the transmitted wave vector because the transmitted wave vector will be related to the constituent parameters of the second medium. Okay. So, they will be equal to omega times square root mu 2 epsilon 2. So, please keep these relationships in mind. We will have use for these equations shortly. Okay. So, this is the structure that I have and you can see that the magnetic field is along the y direction and the difference is that the magnetic field changes its direction or the electric field changes its direction depending on uh, the appropriate uh, you know changes that are required so that the field actually starts to move in the minus z direction. Okay. Also, let me tell you that the way I have drawn E i and the way I have drawn E r 
they are completely arbitrary. Okay. I can you know imagine that electric field E i can be drawn this way and the E r can still be retained in the same way, I can change that one. The equations will tell me later on whether I have used the correct directions or I have used the incorrect direction. So, in other words the direction of the reflected fields and the transmitted fields, well the reflected fields and transmitted fields are more or less determined by the equations. So, if you get confused that you know instead of writing E r in one of the exercises or somewhere you have actually chosen to write this as E r in this way, do not worry the equations will tell you which way the electric fields are directed. Okay. So, do not worry about the directions of the incident and reflected fields. Okay. Now, first I would like to write the corresponding wave vectors for the transmitted and reflected I mean incident reflected and transmitted field. So, I want to write down the propagation vectors k i, k r and k t. Okay. Luckily for me k i and k t are oriented with the same x and z kind of components of course, the actual values will be different. k i the incident wave vector or the incident propagation constant or propagation coefficient is given by the magnitude of k i the incident wave vector times cos theta i along z axis plus k i sin theta i along x axis. So, clearly if you decompose the k i vector you will see that this would be k i cos theta i along the z axis downwards and k i sin theta i in the horizontal direction. Similarly, k t will be equal to k t magnitude cos theta t z hat plus k t sin theta t x hat and k r will be equal to magnitude of k r times cos theta r with a minus sign for the z component because the wave is moving away from the plane of interface correct. So, the wave is moving away from the plane of interface, but it will have the same component or the component in the same direction along the x direction in this case. So, it will be k r sin theta r x hat. Okay. We will assume that the fields are described by their you know phase factors which are in the form of e power minus j k dot r which for the incident wave vectors means that this is k i vector dot r vector is nothing but x x hat plus z z hat. Okay. So, this would be e power minus k i dot x x hat plus z z hat you can substitute for k i from this expression. So, you will see that this would be k i cos theta i z plus k i sin theta i into x. Okay. So, please do make this substitution and actually write down the phase factors for each of the three waves. Okay. Now, look at the electric field over here. right? So, this electric field can be decomposed into two components. One component will be along the x axis, the other component will be along the z axis. The component along the z axis is definitely the component that is normal to the plane of interface and therefore, of no help for us when applying the boundary condition. Similarly, E r can be decomposed into the z component and the x component. In this case, it would be minus z and minus x the way we have written them. But again, whether it is plus z or minus z, that particular component is perpendicular to the plane of interface having no use for us in the boundary condition. Same case for E t as well. Okay. So, my first job is to write down what is the electric field incident wave vector and if I go back to this you know picture, I can see that this k i line makes an angle of theta i with respect to the perpendicular line over here. So, at this junction, so maybe I am you know not very nicely showing it to you. So, between these two the angle is theta i, so the one that I showed you with the orange now, but I do not want that angle. What I want is the angle that e i makes with respect to either the vertical line or with the horizontal line. But because k and e are perpendicular, the sum of the angles here plus the sum of the angles in the next one should be equal to 90 degrees. So, luckily the angle e i with respect to the vertical will therefore, be equal to 90 minus theta i and if I decompose the electric field incident vector, I will have e i cos theta or cos of 90 minus theta i along the minus z axis and e i sin 90 minus theta i along the x axis. So, let me write down that. So, E i is equal to 
the magnitude of E i, I do not know that, I mean it is given as part of the problem, but right now it is just a constant for us. E i cos 90 minus theta i along the minus z direction, so this would be along minus z direction, okay, plus E i sin 90 minus theta i along the x axis, right. But this is not of my interest, so I would not really bother with that one. Of course, I have not also written the phase factor, I should write the phase factor as e power minus j k i dot r here. So, again the entire thing gets multiplied by e power minus j k i dot r okay, for the incident phase factor. So, here I have sin of 90 minus theta, so this is nothing but sin 90 cos theta i, therefore, this is cos theta i is what I am looking at. So, I have e i cos theta i e to the power minus j, let me write down k i dot r completely. So, I have k i cos theta i z plus k i sin theta i x. Okay. So, this is the tangential component of the incident electric field. What about the tangential component for the transmitted field? Well, that would be e t cos theta t following the same argument, it would be e t cos theta t e power minus j k t cos theta t times z plus k t sin theta t x. Okay. So, that is coming from this relationship. So, here you have k i as k i cos theta i and k i sin theta i. The electric field of the transmitted and the incident wave vectors make the same you know or in the same kind of a direction. So, therefore, they are easy to write this one. For E r, I need to find out the angle. So, the angle made by k r with respect to the vertical line will be theta r. Therefore, the angle made by the red line E r with respect to the vertical line will be 90 minus theta r. But this time the electric field will have a component of minus z, right. So, it would have a component along minus z and a minus x component. So, I can go back to this one and rewrite this as minus E r which is the reflected field amplitude times because there is also a 90 minus theta r associated there will be cos 90 minus theta r along the z axis, but sin 90 minus theta r along the minus x axis which again means that this would be a cosine wave only. So, this would be cos of theta r and let us write down the complete you know expression for the phase factor this would be k r cos theta r z this would be a minus direction plus k r sin theta r into x. So, these are the tangential fields that I have for the medium 1 and medium 2 and boundary condition tells me that the tangential electric fields in medium 1 must be equal to the total tangential electric field in medium 2 at the boundary and what is the boundary interface that we have? Boundary interface is z equal to 0. Right. So, I can substitute for z equal to 0 which allows me to simply remove all these z dependent terms. Okay. So, I remove all the z dependent terms, all the plus terms also I will remove and I just have a phase factor which is now dependent on x. Now, this is not what we expected for the case. In the normal incidence when we applied the boundary condition at z equal to 0, right, the phase factors just became a constant. They did not depend on x, y or z. Right. In this case, they depend on x, y or z. So, does it matter that I satisfy the boundary conditions at one point, but does not satisfy the boundary or do not satisfy the boundary conditions at the other point? You cannot have that. So, these relationships have to be valid at all points of x. Okay? And the only way that you can actually have them valid at all points of x is when you know when you make the phase factors be equal to each other k i sin theta i is equal to k r sin theta r which must be equal to k t sin theta t. Okay. Otherwise, you would not be able to satisfy this at different I mean at all points of x. Okay. Now, there is no surprise that k i must be equal to k r after all they both are in the same media the incident field and the reflected fields are both traveling in the same media. Therefore, these amplitudes are the same, but now look at this very beautiful relationship sin theta i is equal to sin theta r right and theta i and theta r in our case can go from 0 to 90 and if your range is only from 0 to 90 
and sin theta is equal to sin theta r, then the only condition that you can you know draw from this only conclusion that you can draw from this is that theta r is equal to theta i. Okay? This is a very important thing and in literature or in your 10th standard, 8th standard you might have known this as Snell's law of reflection. Right? The angle of reflection is equal to angle of transmission that so called law is just a consequence of boundary condition that is little bit of a surprising. Second law that you would have studied will would have related the in angle of incidence refractive index angle of this one transmission out or the refraction as we would call that one and that comes by equating k t sin t to k i sin theta i. Okay. So, what is that relationship k i I know is given by omega into square root of mu 1 epsilon 1 and sin theta is just sin theta i, this must be equal to omega square root mu 2 epsilon 2 sin theta t. And if you, you know, if you do not know this one, the refractive index n, which is the refractive index is defined as the square root of the relative permittivity of the medium. Okay. So, in the first medium you had square root of mu 1 epsilon 1, which can be written as square root of mu 1 okay epsilon r 1 epsilon 0 okay and for the medium 2 you had a mu 2 epsilon 2 under root okay this can be written as square root of mu 2 epsilon r 2 epsilon naught if i assume same magnetic media therefore having mu 1 equal to mu 2 then the equation that we have written here so this equation can actually be rewritten as square root epsilon r 1 sin theta i is equal to square root epsilon r 2 sin theta t. Okay. This identifying square root of epsilon r 1 as the refractive index of the first medium n 1, you have n 1 sin theta i equal to n 2 sin theta t and this relationship is what is called as Snell's law of refraction, refraction being another word for transmission. Is not it beautiful that we actually obtained the Snell's law of reflection, wherein the angle of reflection is equal to angle of incidence. Furthermore, the incident wave, the reflected wave and everything lie in the same plane. While we also obtained the second law, which is Snell's law of refraction, okay, which tells you that n 1 sin theta i must be equal to n 2 sin theta t. The angle of incidence, sin of angle of incidence to sin of angle of refraction must be some ratio of n 2 to n 1 and therefore, that must be constant as long as n 2 and n 1 are constants themselves. Are we done yet? Well, we are kind of done, but we still need to understand the reflected field amplitude to the incident field amplitude and transmitted field amplitude to the incident field amplitude. In other words, I want to derive the reflection coefficient and the transmission coefficient for the amplitudes only, the ratio of amplitudes. In order to do that one, I go back to the boundary condition, well from the boundary condition that I had, I had E i cos theta i, E t cos theta t and minus E r cos theta r. In the medium 1, we have E i cos theta i correct, minus E r cos theta r, but cos theta r is nothing but cos theta i. So, I can rewrite that one as theta i itself. This must be equal to E t cos theta t. Are we done yet? Well, we are not done here because we still have the magnetic field relationships. Okay. The magnetic field relationship is that the magnetic field is along the y direction in the, in the region 1, it is along the y direction in region 2, y direction in the region 3. Right? So, because they are all in the y direction and y direction happens to be tangential to the plane of interface z equal to 0, you can, you can write the amplitudes of the incident field as h i plus h r must be equal to h t. Okay. Now, h i can be rewritten as e i by eta 1, h r can be written as e i by eta 2, which is the amplitude ratios. Right? So, this must be equal to e t by eta 2, sorry, this e uh, h r is e i by eta 1 only because it is in the same medium. Now, you have two equations, two unknowns, you know, you can combine the equations and obtain gamma which is the reflection coefficient for the T m case. T m is what we have considered the magnetic field is actually perpendicular, right? the magnetic field is perpendicular to the 
plane or this is also called as a parallel polarization and this reflection coefficient for the TM case therefore, if you solve the equations will be eta 2 cos theta t minus eta 1 cos theta i divided by eta 2 cos theta t plus eta 1 cos theta i. This is a slightly simple way to remember that this is eta cos theta t. See you had the electric field in this way right. What is the tangential component of the electric field? The tangential component of the electric field was E i cos theta i. If you divide this one by h i, E i by h i will be eta, eta of the first medium that is getting multiplied by cos theta i. So, if you define the impedance of the medium as eta t m, okay, eta t m for the first medium right, which would be eta 1 times cos theta i. Similarly, you define eta t m for the second medium which would be eta 2 cos theta t right. Then you can remember this one gamma t m as simply the second the load impedance eta 2 of t m minus eta 1 t m divided by eta 2 t m plus eta 1 t m. Okay. The transmission coefficient for the case you know the transverse magnetic polarization case is given by 2 eta 2 cos theta i this is not the same. So, there is a slight change here. So, do note that one eta 2 cos theta t plus eta 1 cos theta i. Okay. So, this is the transmission coefficient and what we have obtained here is the reflection coefficient. There is one more case which we have not discussed and in this case what you have is the you know oblique incidence at an angle of theta i reflection and transmission, but here the electric field lines will be perpendicular to the plane of interface and the plane of incidence. So, in other words the polarization here is what is called as the uh, perpendicular polarization perpendicular because the electric field happens to be perpendicular to the plane of incidence and the interface. This case is also called as transverse electric polarization. Okay. In the transverse electric polarization you will have the magnetic field H in the same uh, plane as the x and z planes okay, whereas the electric field will be perpendicular to it. Again you can define or you can derive gamma T e which is the reflection coefficient and even for this case theta r will be equal to theta i and n 1 sin theta i will be equal to n 2 sin theta t. Okay. So, these relationships are independent of what polarizations that you have. In fact, when you studied this Snell's laws, you never were told that this is applicable for T e or applicable for T m modes or T m polarizations. Okay. You can derive the expression for gamma T e as well. Gamma T e will be uh, you know you can actually obtain this one as eta 2 secant theta t minus eta 1 secant theta i divided by eta 2 secant theta t plus eta 1 secant theta i. Okay. Again one you know reasonable way to uh, think of this one is because the tangential h component here will be cos theta i. right? So, it will be h i magnitude times cos theta i. The medium impedance can be obtained by looking at the tangential electric field which would be E i along the y direction. Now, E i by h i is eta, eta divided by cos theta will be eta times secant theta. So, you can define this eta 2 secant theta as the effective impedance for the T e case of the second medium. This would be effective impedance for the T e case of the first medium and so on. So, this way you can remember only one formula for reflection coefficient which is z2 minus z1 by z2 plus z1 and replace z2 by appropriately tm case eta 2 tm or eta 1 tm and similarly for te case you replace that z by eta times te I mean eta of te case. So, this uh, you know completes our discussion of oblique incidence. Please review all the relationships carefully the surprising aspects of oblique incidence and the appearance of total internal reflection is what we will do in the next module. Until then, thank you very much.